I haven't been to LA for a while, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I stopped in Burbank for a couple hours um, last month, but uh, that's the the closest I've been. So I don't think I've seen you um, since 2017, maybe. Um, we were on campus. It was it was when I first started teaching my class there uh, at UCLA Recreation. Um, and so that was, I want to say 18. Okay. Let's, yeah. let's call it 18 then. Yeah. Not, not a huge difference, but you know, <laughs> still far too long, far too long. <laughs> yeah. Um, it could have been 18. What was I doing there in 18? Um, you, were, you were teaching a class. You had oh, I was teaching. Stuff. Sure. Okay. Yeah, you had your professor's blazer with the patches on the elbows. I felt so inadequate. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not an envious person, but I admire big time. I'm a big time active admirer. And I was just like, look at this. He's professing. I love this. <laughs> Good you know, th there's not an official uniform, but like you dress a certain way, you're, you're regarded a certain way, right? Mm -hmm. And um, there's something to be said for the elbow patches. I don't know. Some some people aren't into it. Um, I am, you know. Who I'm not be into it. <laughs> I mean, well, you know what? I, I'll put it this way, and you'll you'll appreciate my appreciation for what you appreciate. Um, listen, there's a vestment for everything, okay? <laughs> And as such, sure, you don't have to have the elbow patches. I know that there might be a, you know, a gender bias to such uh, elements of a uniform. But all the same, if you want there to be no question, if you're on campus wearing a blazer, first of all, and you pass the student visible, you know, demographic, those patches confirm without a badge or anything else. You're not looking down on anybody. In fact, they face backwards. It's just a small subtle reminder that, um, hey, I've earned these stripes. You know, you could wear your doctoral stripes on your arm. Those patches are a good substitute for that. Uh, and it's right before the Lord. So there you have it. There you have it. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, West Coast gear is a little different than East Coast. East Coast, oh, you've got to go a little so. more formal. Here, Very we right. can get away with sneakers, jeans, you know, sort of the Jerry Seinfeld look, but with a blazer on afterwards, yes. you know. And uh, okay. Yeah. I, I had forgotten that I was, um, I had this period where I went, um, I had graduated and I went back and forth teaching a couple of times. Yes. Um, and yeah, I could have been even in 2018, 2019. Yeah, 2018 would have been in the fall, right? And then 2019, maybe in the uh, uh, spring. But uh, well, good to see you again, at least. Nothing yeah. else. Good to see you. Good to be seen and not viewed. Um, you know, good to, to meet uh, virtually. I, I, I'm grateful for all the lessons that we've learned during the pandemic era um, as we enter the next stage of it. Uh, I'm hoping that everybody will appreciate uh, what we've come out of this thing with, for better or worse, uh, and look forward. Uh, and certainly the ability to bring uh, what was once a distant future concept. You know, in the Jetsons, they had, you know, video phones back in the late 60s. When we were kids, they told us that one day there'll be a computer on every desk and we'll be holding our telephones without wires and looking at each other. And we kind of said, hey, that'll be nice. We'll also have flying cars, but that's a big rip. Um, <laughs> well, the cars don't fly yet, but here we are um, in two different states face to face. And I love it. It's weird. I, you know, like all the sci-fi of uh, the, the era we grew up with is materialized, you know, even so. I saw something years ago, how um, Picard had an iPad back in 1988 yeah. uh -huh. <laughs> on next gen. Yes, laptops and iPads. What, what's so funny is I saw an old clip from a TV show from somewhere in the late 80s, early, early 90s. And like the grandparents had given the granddaughter a laptop and it was literally a small suitcase. And it was like this being supposed to be this new, you know, technology, blah, blah, blah. And I was laughing, but I was like, I also remember when, you know, if it wasn't clunky enough, it wasn't good. You know what I mean? We needed to have proof. The, the cell phone needed to be like this in order for us to, you can't really see it, but two, two stacked together was barely enough, you know, to have the status symbol and, 
you know, now we're much more refined and, you know. Yeah. Well, you mentioned talking about um, things we've learned. Um, yes. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you today. I mean, you've gone through a okay. demon and um, you've earned, a, you know, the, the doctor. Um, or, or are you Reverend Doctor? How do I, what's your title and title sequence nowadays? Uh, it's a demon for those of you, that's a uh, doctoral uh, or doctoral ministry. Um, a doctor yeah. of ministry is, I think it's called. Right. Yeah, ministry, doctor of ministry. So it's it's apparently according to to um, my seminary, my most recent seminary, it is the Reverend Doctor. Now there are some places that insist on everything, including the D, the the. Uh, my mother does not like to see me even write my own name without the handle. She's very formal. Um, and at my church, um, they just called me pastor, sort of a shorthand for a first name basis. I tried to get Pastor Wayne in there. They were like, nope, that's that's too far. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> pastor who? Even, yeah, it's like, I don't know if that's that they want to respect me or they just don't want me to get that familiar. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and in most cases, I still answer to my own name sort of uninhibited just because uh, it's easier that way. Uh, however, my online presence does have a slight uh, um, adjustment. It's Doc Hop, okay? Uh, when I was smaller, it was Wing Hop because the little kids couldn't say Wayne. They called me Wing, uh, and Wing Hop was like my email address and all my online stuff, and that is more from Wing Hop to Doc Hop, and that's where my website is, dochopint.com, D-O-C-H-O-P-E-N-T.com. So if you need support with your communication, writing, public speaking, or any business uh, documentation, I'm there to support you with that and um, much, much more. <laughs> well, I think that's that's where we found out we were first related is through the, the wing um, heritage. Yes. You know, That's each right. of us having some kind of wing <laughs> in our name, mm -hmm. um, regardless of if it's historical etymology, that don't matter. Um, right. You know, we, we found a, you know, a, a place of agreement on that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Always just way to find family. <laughs> talk to us about, you know, what you what you did your research on, you know, and kind of not not necessarily just the pa I know the pastoral side intersects with your research sure. but but i'm a little more interested in the the questions you're asking um and how that research is you know not just um an assignment right like sometimes when we do um we do official work be it a master's thesis or a doctoral uh, dissertation mm -hmm. you know we're sitting down to accomplish a task it's an assignment but how is it moving you forward either in in, for, in your case, I know they overlap, but either in the, the ministry or in uh, further research. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me. I didn't say that up front. So thank you for having me, uh, Dr. Wingard. I, I'm, I'm loving this. Um, and for the viewers, uh, my uh, dissertation, my doctoral research was um, titled at the end, Walk Worthy, Not Weary, Balancing the Calling and Career of the Bivocational Pastor, okay? Uh, in some denominations, um, the leaders of the spiritual community only do that. And in a lot of cases, that is true. Um, but there is a significant number of people who, uh, church planters or people who uh, chose to continue in a secular career, um, maybe for financial reasons, you know, they have a better salary and pension, and that allows them to serve at a different level. Um, and then in some cases, if a congregation is smaller or newer or has experienced shifts, you know, just prior to the pandemic uh, in the United States, there have been two major um, real estate bubble bursts, which affected right. families, home ownership, and that impacts community churches or charitable giving. You know, churches are supposed to be run as nonprofit organizations, donation-based only. They might own property or have some uh, residual um, income, but for the most part, it's out of the generosity of people as they are able. And even if you tithe and, and have demands and pledges and all that kind of stuff, in general, a church is going to live or not live based on what people are able to give. So as a result, people like myself have continued to work a sort of dual career. 
both in ministry and in the secular space. I kind of didn't like the bivocational pastor term so much after a while because it, um, I don't know, it's kind of clunky uh, and it, it's sort of, it's not exactly outdated, um, but I think it needed a facelift. So now I refer to myself as a multi-platform professional, okay? And one of my platforms is the pastoral and spiritual platform, meaning that I can work or I can operate at a high level of expertise, experience, knowledge, uh, skill set. Uh, and if it happens to overlap from one place to the other, it's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. The research that I encountered first was very uh, out of date, very, um, I would say, sexist and unintentionally racist because it presumed a standard that was geared toward white Protestant males in the middle of America without any real uh, reference to other parts of the country. So for example, uh, the presumption that a church is going to be this nice little oasis, this island in the middle of a large, you know, yard and parking lot with, you know, plenty of space. Um, that's really not true in most urban centers. Um, that's not really relevant outside of place like where I grew up in South Carolina or, or say Texas, where, you know, you just physically have the land available to have these expansive, you know, mega churches. Um, then you go into some inner, inner city um, spaces where um, it's condensed or you have, say, the storefront mm -hmm. or places where people now commute in where, as the churches were founded, uh, they were neighborhood churches where people walked. Now, as they drive, that impacts the, the dynamics, the demographics. And from a leadership standpoint, we find that a whole lot of people in pastoral ministry have needed to continue functioning in their careers because it's actually an extension of their ministry call. So if someone is working in the social sciences, if they're teaching an educator, it's probably good to have an educator that has a spiritual basis, even though they're not, say, in a school or at a college to preach or to teach that spiritual content. They're still going in there with a mission. A whole lot of people want to say, oh, well, we've got to go, therefore, into all nations. Uh, but in America, it's big. And we probably need to go across the street, go next door to our neighbor, go back down the freeway before we try crossing an ocean in order to reach people who need our support and our help. So in summary of the, the overarching idea behind this, I found myself with a multiplicitous career that included uh, entertainment, film and television production. I had a corporate career that led me to become a corporate manager now at a major nonprofit organization. Uh, I have this educational component that started before our shared uh, theological study at Fuller Seminary, uh, but I had begun teaching first with younger people and then being asked to be a speaker and lecturer at various different you know, teaching opportunities. And then from the pastoral standpoint, I was a youth pastor and minister as an associate in a medium-sized family congregation called into a historical uh, com church community in Watts, California, uh, home of uh, the Watts Towers, also oh, yeah. the of the iconic um, you know, Watts riots, but many other wonderful things. Um, and what I realized that the community I was coming into was a perfect example of why it's important to honor the labor of ministry. Yes, you have the church, but if you're in, you know, unless you have a, an inclusive uh, meaning that you have this day in, day out sort of uh, liturgical um, footprint, um, most people are going to go to work, go home, and then come to church. And then when they come to that spiritual space, that's where they're refilled, replenished, and prepared to go back out and do the work of ministry. So, um, what I did and aimed to do was to identify uh, biblical characters, precepts, and examples of where uh, to labor outside the temple was not a violation. If anything, it was an extension uh, and an active uh, way to stay connected uh, to the people who need the things that we preach, teach, and pray about all the time. So I hope that opens it up well. Yeah, it does. And, uh, you know, one thing you said um, struck me as theology that uh, I, I relate to, and that's the tension between people who are dualists, you know, mm -hmm. they have a worldview mm -hmm. that is set in a certain, uh, well, it, it perceives reality according mm -hmm. to, um, call it a dualistic tradition, but it, it's a harmonious 
way of perceiving reality. You have night and you have day, you have male, you have female, you know, you have young, you have old, you have a, a series of contrasts that sort of set up the way um, the world is framed. And, and I'm, you know, my tradition is not that it's actually um, much more streamlined into one reality. And I think that's what you're, you're leaning toward with the whole multi-platform pastor versus the bivocational, because if you're bivocational, it's like, what you do in your work is not your calling. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not necessarily so it's a, you know, the way you're phrasing it is it's a different setting mm -hmm. for how you interact with people as someone, you know, who is um, a minister, a pastor, someone who is um, active in, in the life of shepherding people. Right. And so that being the case, um, you know, why limit it to buy? Why not try vocational? Why not, you know, um, would we go uh, tetra or or <laughs> quattro? I don't know if we go to the Latin or the Greek for this, but, you know, like, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. We, we can keep going down the line with yeah. all the different things we do and the hats we wear. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really related to that. That was, you know, nice. And I wonder if you in just going through the literature or even maybe dialoguing with, um, you know, people in the time since, you know, what seems more re relatable, what seems more standard for the way people perceive, um, you know, the approach, you know, that you're really investigating, you know, do they see things in a, dualistically or do they see it uh, multiform as, as you? I, you I think what was, has, what has been exposed is, um, the nature, at least in our, and when I when I kind of remind when I when I use the term American, uh, I do that on purpose because it is a very American thing to talk about how things are in absolute terms. But we really don't have a large global worldview unless we've actually done the travel or had the intercultural experience. So I, I've had to learn to correct myself on that too. Um, even coming from South Carolina to Los Angeles, I mean, I was in major culture shock, even though I went to similar churches of similar denominations, uh, I found vast differences in the way that was played out um, across the board. So I had to have a more open mind. So when it comes to um, the way people um, perceive uh, what I've illuminated or what I've attempted to explore, um, it really is eye opening. Uh, a lot of people just sort of go with what they know. Um, in, 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 in media, in, in pop culture, you typically see one of two things. Say you're watching a movie or a television show. They would typically show priests um, off after the Catholic or Anglo style with the collar and the black suit. And, you know, they wouldn't necessarily go so far as to have a rosary, but they'd be, you know, very clean cut or whatever. Um, usually taller than everybody else, unless their height was a part of the character. Um, and then they would have these very... Um, I would say generic homogenized visions of what church was supposed to be. Then when they would show the black people, um, they would always be, you know, in this very uh, effervescent kind of setting. And the preachers, unfortunately, would always be this sort of um, combination of, you know, James Brown and Elmer Gantry, where they've got to have the raspy voice and they're dressed very flamboyantly. Well, there's some historical um, 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 basis for that, but that's certainly not the overwhelming um, uh, image that most people in that culture or subculture really have. Uh, I always wondered as a kid, how come we never saw on television more preachers that were like Dr. Martin Luther King, who was, uh, who was an academic? You know, they never stereotyped that. So as a result, people think, well, a pastor should be this sort of prim, proper guy, he probably wears glasses, you know, like Ned Flanders, you know, Ned, <laughs> oddly enough, Ned is not the Reverend. <laughs> Reverend Lovejoy is kind of like a, you know, is the Simpsons characters for those who don't know. Uh, but anyway, the, the, the stereotypes that we've kind of worked with is, well, he lives at the church. I had a little girl when I first went to my church. She says, hi, it's so good to see you, Pastor. You live here with Jesus, don't you? <laughs> So the idea that the pastor doesn't have a life outside the church is really a thing that people have just accepted without a lot of thought. Okay, he has a wife, he has kids, they have this picture-perfect family that kind of goes across cultures. Um, and then when you talk about um, the vocational element of it, um, why are pastor's salaries so high? 
who are you talking about? Yeah, right. Are you talking about the mega church pastor who has a jet and a Rolls Royce, which was probably purchased from his book sales and CD sales, not necessarily on the backs of congregants, but that stereotype is very strong. Mm -hmm. Or you say, hey, here's this dynamic person, um, you know, Joel Olstein, Robert Schuller, people like that, who kind of go away from the core of the gospel and do this sort of positive thinking thing. So they're not even really preaching and teaching. They've just got people in for a feel good session. Um, and, and again, you kind of have this large view. And then when you get to the work, who are the people that are showing up at the hospital to visit? Who's getting the call when someone passes away mm -hmm. and the family members really just don't know what to do? Right. Uh, who are the people who are um, showing up to write letters uh, for court cases and to um, do counseling, pastoral counseling, which is quite different from clinical counseling, but you know, when a marriage is on the rocks or children are at risk, um, that is the vocational element of pastoring that people never see or hear about because it just doesn't make for good entertainment. Yeah. So then you add to that, well, how does a person get qualified for that? Um, we knew a lot of people at Fuller Seminary, bless their hearts, they had it good. Their denomination or their local church had enough money to send them, fund them to school without worrying about where they're going to live, how much the books cost, even coming to Los Angeles, as expensive place as this is, um, they didn't really have to come and work their way up into that luxury That's of education. Right. Um, meanwhile, there are many others of us who were working full time, now full time students, people who were in marriages and now having to balance parenthood with all this sort of thing. And if a person takes on a part time job at a store or, you know, works a few extra hours driving, now we have ride share, things of that nature in the gig economy. Well, that's OK, as long as it's not making the church look bad or maybe it doesn't. You know, maybe we don't tell the congregation in one of the books I read. Is it appropriate for the pastor's wife to work? And the response <laughs> was, if she is a teacher or perhaps a nurse, wow. if she ideally works part time, if she otherwise ideally works at the church in some capacity as a piano player, teaching Sunday school, or maybe the secretary or something like that. Um, in other words, having that spousal support would be okay if it would help out but there should be some move for the congregation to really do better to pay the pastor more now would he be paid at or or she at this point be paid at a market rate compared to other professions with a required doctoral degree or masters yeah. uh, you know master of divinity um no he should be working at minimal um expense to the church because that's his gift that's his ministry he's supposed to take whatever we can scoop up to give him and be okay with it that is based on an ideal of i guess propriety or you know we don't want to look greedy or we don't want to be the flashy greedy whatever um we just want to tank a gas okay <laughs> so in order to feed my family in order to serve the church at a higher level, even if I have to have specific office hours or designate my time a certain way, why shouldn't I or someone with professional skills with the ability to be recruited into a higher level of just income for survival, but also to work at the higher levels of, of brain and, and mastery skillfulness? Um, it should be okay. And some of the characters that I did find biblically that sort of bore this out, I was very surprised at some of the things that I found there. And of course, we have to apply it to our context. But I think part of that is breaking through the stereotypes that people have that, you know, a pastoral person has already accepted a life of sacrifice mm -hmm. and suffering. Uh, so they should be poor or they should, um, you know, not ask for much. Um, and even if they have all these other skills, I just need them to give me a message that I want to hear on Sunday, make me feel better about myself, absolve me of my sins and um, or, or, you know, make me say amen a few times. Don't go over 15 minutes. Marry me, bury me and go on with your life if you have have one if you don't i don't care one way or the other that's kind of that's kind of what we're up against here it's you know it part of it too is well part of it i think a good chunk of it is just maybe um you know following the uh industrial revolution and what that did for uh the, you know i hesitate to use the word prosperity but really we're we're enjoying the fruits today of 
that effort and how it changed. Like everyone was poor except a couple people and the things they have or had back then, um, you know, we may not have as uh, large places to live as the wealthy uh, of 200 years ago, but my bed is probably softer. You know, yeah, it's probably yeah, yeah. more comfortable, right? Um, I have this technology. I have mobility in an automobile. Things that, you know, they resulted from that movement, um, you know, socially and economically um, following the Industrial Revolution. And now we've got this, this um, you know, matter of, like you said, oh, well, the, the pastor's supposed to be poor. He's, you know, mm-hmm. versus the, the, the perception of those megachurch uh, pastors who have things like you know the the private jet and what have you. Um, what's the what's really at stake? I think is um, how how money works today too, mm. and you know managing daily bread, um, you know which is you know the, the call it the stability of income. You know mm. we could probably think of a different way to you know conceive of daily bread, but uh, a stable income you know, versus, you know, um, service without regard to, um, to any income. And uh, it's an interesting question because in the traditions that I'm, uh, I'm a part of, uh, I'm Orthodox for those who, um, you know, are newer listeners, uh, in certain jurisdictions, they make the priest um, who usually has a family. It's rare to have a celibate priest in the Orthodox tradition, mm-hmm. but th- they'll make a priest um, have a primary means of employment, mm-hmm. and the church would provide an honorarium. Um, in um, others, in the Egyptian tradition, the Coptic Orthodox, they uh, fund their priests with mm-hmm. a, a competitive or competitive, not like it, it wouldn't be, you know, um, high skill well how should i put it it's a middle class you know competitive Um, 500 ceo well you know that's i I hesitate because i know people who were you know uh, ceos of companies like that uh, physicians lawyers engineers who gave up their uh, past professions to pursue priestly ministry so they took a large pay cut but even Mm. that pay cut is still larger than the um the other jurisdiction, um, Mm -hmm. which does not fund a full-time priest, Mm -hmm. um, you know, to care for the needs of the community. Um, you know, the opposite end of that though is the community tends to suffer, um, with lack of access. And then the standard is that they're disengaged, (laughs) you know, compared to the one who's able to provide for his family. Um, let's say in the Coptic tradition, the Syriac tradition, it's interesting, there's a base income um, mm. that the priests are provided, but then they work off of um, the old Ottoman system, which mm. if I say it the way I want to say it, people may take it the wrong way, uh, but I'm going to say it anyway, because I'm Ooh, better at offending yeah. people yeah, than yeah, I, I am at, at smoothing <laughs> things out, right? Like I, <laughs> I let other, when it's time to communicate with sensitive people, I take a back seat. And I let other people step up and, you know, they, they bring the flowers and the spices <laughs> and the incense, the fragrances. And, you know, whereas me, I'm just, psh, uh, yeah, I'll bring uh, the myrrh. Don't worry. <laughs> exactly. But it's like they, um, the old Ottoman system was, you know, the, the priest would visit people's homes mm-hmm. um, to care for them and they'd make an offering to the priest and his family, but it wasn't like cash money. Cause that didn't mm-hmm. exist the way we think of it today. You know, it could be some, you know, type of uh, coinage, zuze, as they're mm-hmm. given. Um, sometimes it's food, you know, or whatever. Like, they take care of their clergy, mm-hmm. you know, like, but everyone had, everyone was poor. Mm-hmm. So, you know, in the situation where there is less mobility because poverty is the standard, you know, you have the system where you work off of tips. And that's kind of how I think of it. You're working off a tip. Mm-hmm. So, they have a base income and then they get tips. <laughs> you go yeah. to dinners, right? Mm-hmm. And that's a vestige of that old Ottoman system. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know that it's efficient. And I think what you're doing, you know, in, in what you're looking at is um, it's an important conversation 
for every denomination to think about because it, it is truly balancing a ministerial calling, a vocational, and the vocation we're talking about here is the ministry, right? Um, that sort of calling, which is a full-time calling, mm-hmm. you know? Very much so. That's why you can't be bi- bivocational. You don't stop being, you know, um, pastor, Pastor right. Wayne, Pastor WC, Doc yep. Hop. You don't stop <laughs> being this person when you go back into the nonprofit or, you know, the film industry or the TV industry. You know, you are you. Yeah. And you are you full time. Mm-hmm. And so that's that's not going to change. If people need you, what are you going to do? You're going to say, nah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, yeah, and, and, I, and I really appreciate you sharing from uh, the Eastern traditions because that's that's information that I didn't have. And my advisors did, um, you know, kind of give me some guidance to just focus on my more immediate context, you know, with some reference to uh, slightly broader um, comparisons, uh, you know, because for example, you know, I'm 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 African American, if if you hadn't noticed, um, and I serve a primarily African American congregation, but the African American church experience in America uh, is not monolithic. I mean, there are Methodists, Baptists, Catholics, Episcopalians, Pentecostals, and so forth. Um, not to mention uh, those um, African African American tradition uh, right, you know, yeah. congregations that are you know from. Africa or the Caribbean or other places where, um, you know, people from the continent have have the diaspora, as we call it. Um, so in essence, I appreciate you sharing that because it, there are certain parallels or certain commonalities that I think we find. Um, I think every culture, um, even at the, you know, most pristine high dollar um you know, congregation, say Dallas, Texas or somewhere, uh, yeah. if a new pastor comes to town, of course, everybody's going to want to feed them and, you know, get to know the family and make the kids feel comfortable and invite the wife to become a part of the society, ladies, whatever it is, you know. Um, and so what I realized for me, and and again, there's a transitional element, too, because I came at this, um, I let's see, I started my preaching in at about 32 Hmm. um and so almost exactly 10 years after that uh i'm still only 39 now but (laughs) uh, a decade later i take over a a church you know which is a very a vastly different experience being the pastor leader of a church and you're absolutely right i have a smaller to mid-sized congregation it's in a beautiful uh compact building with lots of land and so forth around it but it is a full-time experience no matter what the pay is it's a full-time obligation to your life to your family to every part of you so the l the the fact that or the notion that there would be sacrifice full skippy yes and so what one has to do and i talk about this in my in my paper uh is you have to learn how to discern what the needs are and what the requirements are for a given time. So when it comes to, well, do I keep my job in the first place? There was about, a, let's see, two to three year period where I did not have a secular full-time job. I did a series of, you know, part-time or, you know, gig-oriented things where that's where my teaching at UCLA started during that period. Uh, I did some ride share. In other words, I enjoyed being able to go and park at my church office for the better part of the day, maybe drive at night, do other things. But at a certain point, economically, I needed to have something a little bit more aggressive so that I was not taking all of the church's resources. Um, And the brutal truth is I had to make that call uh, without anyone validating it. I could have made those demands. I could have pushed, but that would not have been evangelistic. Right. That would have been economic. If yeah. I say go out and bring more people, and as a result, the bottom line is going to be better, well, that is a nice result, but that can't be the primary function. So for me, it was a matter of, am I too good to go and till the land mm-hmm. and make a sacrifice or lead the people in sacrifice. If Jesus could be known as a carpenter, um, he must have done that somewhere along the lines between sermons on mounts and things of that nature. If Peter was to fish and be a fisher of men, he was not giving up the boat. He was just doing recruiting really of a dual nature. Hey, I need to give you some work and I'm also going to give you some word and as a result, allow you to 
earn your keep and get something to eat and feed your family. So in other words, that duality is not necessarily in opposition. Uh, it's an encompassing kind of thing. Uh, and one of the tools that I developed that I talk about and that I use quite frequently now, I'm so glad that this came to me, as I, I apply a discernment matrix. When I'm not sure how to make a decision, is this right? Is this something I should take on? Is this something I can do, something I shouldn't do? I go through the steps of this matrix, which helps me to prioritize the calling. You're absolutely right. The vocation of pastor, of spiritual leader, of preacher, all that good stuff, it does become the primary thing in your life. And as a result, the other things that you're capable to do, they now become a part of the orbit of that. Mm -hmm. They feed it. They either support it or they allow you to function at a higher level because you're able to do this. It's going to feed into this primary thing. And then it comes to when you do have to say no. Why is that? Well, what is the personal impact? What is the professional impact? You know, maybe if I do this, I'll get more invitations or I'll be able to, you know, charge more and work a little less. You know, uh, what is um, that, that, that preferential uh, element? Do I really want to do this or not? Okay. And then finally, that pastoral impact, even though that's a priority, I put that last because we can always justify things, right? Uh, I, I have to be honest, what is this going to cost me in terms of my pastoral imprint or the, the impact to what it's going to take, if it's going to take away sermon prep time or just meditation time, self care time. One of the biggest problems with working pastors is they're exhausted all the time. Mm -hmm. right, even yeah. if they are paid well, even if the church does this, they take them out to dinner. <laughs> you know, my mother still gets upset that no one, you know, cooks a chicken dinner on Sunday morning anymore. And I'm like, well, mom, first of all, it's not 1942 anymore. <laughs> uh, secondly, we're in California, not Carolina. So I'm going to get some avocado toast if I get that. Oh, good um, good. And then the other thing is because of the work that we must do in ministry, we have to understand our families that we're serving may have different needs now than were even a reality 10, 15 years ago, three years ago, pre pre COVID. Okay. So that discernment is going to help you actually in your leadership of the spiritual uh, community, because you're a part of the same reality that the people are in. Yes, there's protection. No, you can't do everything that everybody else does. I really don't do a lot of happy hours. I don't do a lot of, you know, whatever. But I don't do that and say, well, because of my, you know, pastoral commitment, <laughs> I don't do that. I just say, hey, I've got something else to do or I'm busy or y'all know what I've got going on. I leave work and go to work. That's just kind of how it is. And, um, you know, over time, what I what I get in return or what I kind of demand in return is respect what I do have going on. The church understands I have to work because of whatever reason. So there's really no, you know, opposition to if I, if I'm late, I'm rarely late, but say if I have to either postpone something or something gets canceled, uh, I'm either going to have a sub or have it covered. Uh, but if I'm not physically able to do something, people are very generous in understanding why and respectful and they, they pray for me. And that, that means the world because that means we're in partnership with this kind of dual career. Uh, everybody knows they've got a role to play in help, helping it to uh, survive, you know? You said something that I, I really liked, and that's the idea of being part of the same reality oh, yeah. as the people. And, um, you know, one thing that's, that frequently bothers me, and this isn't, a, it's not limited to the life of the church. Um, it, it, it's applicable across disciplines it's this idea that you know in our tradition at least it's when someone puts on the black right mm -hmm. you know they become part of a different class and then okay yes they are clergy and that's true to a certain extent mm -hmm. but they're they're human beings too mm -hmm. and they live in and among you and um you know when when clergy are most affected is when they're with the people Mm -hmm. And they're sharing in that same reality. In fact, the best priests I knew um, were those, you know, who would sit with us yeah. after um, after the liturgy. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you could feel very comfortable being, you know, open to them with anything because, you know, these people were were truly like family as you. They were living and experiencing the same reality mm -hmm. that you were. And, you know, they weren't servants of a Sunday service. And that's it right? Mm -hmm. You knew they were with you all the time. Yeah. And I think that um, 
that's a it's an important observation. It's obvious in a way, but you know, it's something that I think it's easy to lose sight of when we're concerned with maybe um, I don't know the 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 mechanics of of practice right. and, and not necessarily the life that the practice is pushing us toward. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a, a document um, in the ancient church called the Didache. And, mm-hmm. you know, beyond what the scripture teaches about um, giving and, and taking care of clergy, this also talks about, you know, some of the, the things that are relevant to us today. Mm-hmm. Um, namely, when people come asking for money, like mm-hmm. they're false prophets. Um, <laughs> but when people, you know, when you were there, you were to give the first fruits of, mm-hmm. of what you do. Right. And what that's telling me is, you know, along the lines of what you said, this idea that we're living in a common reality and mm-hmm. that we're each serving one another, right? And so, um, you know, caring for those, you know, who care for us is, mm-hmm. it's cyclic, right? We take right. care of them, they take care of us. We take care of them, they take, you know, and there has to be that, you um, it's not even a reciprocity. It, it's what would you call it? A symbiosis. Is that rather the right word? Like where, you know, you're one organism, you know, you're one body. How right. dare I, you know, <laughs> use language like that. Right. But we're <laughs> ideally we're one body yeah. um, functioning together. Um, so I thought that that reminded me of a lot of, you know, the, mm-hmm. what you said about the charity, you know, coming yeah. from the people and, and caring for you. Uh, I wonder how that works with, you know, and I don't know, maybe you don't experience this personally, maybe you found it in your research, but how does that work then with the neighborhood church versus the commuter church? Because that's, a, that's part of our reality today, you know, and I know people who they would commute over an hour to church. And yeah. I always felt that if, if your church isn't in your neighborhood, um, something's wrong, right? You know, and um, there could be a number of reasons for that being wrong. Maybe they're global reasons for being wrong. You know, maybe they're like denominational issues. Maybe they're matters of history. One empire fighting another, the Roman and Persian Empire, let's say, fighting at a certain time, um, or you know, historical conflicts in Europe that separated people by denomination, and so they inherited a certain tradition and um, all of these things. Like, there's any number of things, but uh, I think you know, in a um, in a vacuum, no, but in a uh, more innocent approach, I guess, um, mm-hmm. you know, it, it seems like we'd want, wouldn't it be nice if, you know, everyone lived near one another, you know, and there was a, a, a community like that sort of uh, revolved around the church. Um, I don't know. Well, let me help you out here, my brother. Um, <laughs> um, we have, again, this this plays out quite differently in America uh, in different ways because it, as the nation is so physically big, uh, it's hard to have a monolithic uh, experience for anybody, any of us. Uh, and we have to look at why communities are shaped the way they are. Um, a lot of this is geography. Uh, a lot of this happens uh, because of, as you say, history. Um, there was a point in time where I learned about the impact of institutionalized racism in Southern California <laughs> that broke my heart because I just had never been made aware of it. I grew up knowing what I knew in South Carolina and the Southeast and even um, the Northeast when I went to college in uh, Ithaca, New York. Um, But that sort of East Coast sensibility um, is sort of kind of how things go there. It is very history minded. Uh, My parents were very active in the civil rights movement. I mean, that all happened just before I was born. My older siblings integrated schools uh, Mm -hmm. that say my mother taught in. Uh, So where you talk about communities um, centering around churches, yes, that is true, but there are ways that that has been molded um, by some of the external forces um, that have caused churches to evolve the way they have. What I found in here in Southern California, specifically uh, Los Angeles and to my uh, particular church where I am now, um, you have a lot of churches within steps of each other 
within a block. I look across the street at the church. There's one down the hall. There's one that we share a rear corner um, uh, touch point because of where people were allowed to buy property or build buildings or live and have homes. So if you have communities that were forced to be in the same geography, but they wanted to retain, say their denominational difference or their cultural unique um, uh, elements, um, they sort of had to flourish where they could. Uh, and then if people were able to say in, a, in an area that is was largely developed with high density, uh, with apartments versus single occupancy homes, uh, with lower income um, design from the beginning, uh, say to be a starter home, but a starter home in Los Angeles is still going to cost you a half a million dollars, yeah. right? And that's now... That's a starter. Uh, and a starter home in LA is not a starter home. Yeah, it's other part, square footage is at least a third. <laughs> yeah, it could be a garage. I've seen a painted gar a, a garage that needed paint and was leaning, and it was like you know three ninety nine and a bargain as a fixer upper. Ooh. So imagine even when you didn't necessarily have uh, the decay of of years or the you know some of the some of the. Um, expansion of time, you still had these confines on uh, society or community or group of people. Um, for us, for example, I have one Hispanic member. I happen to speak enough Spanish to be able to greet her. Now, she speaks perfect English, but there was one Sunday where I just happened to introduce the service um, in Spanish. And everybody's like, oh, and she's like, whoa. <laughs> um, but little things like that did not necessarily turn into a Spanish ministry branch of our church. It didn't necessarily open the doors to have an influx of Hispanic members, even though the community has a huge Hispanic population that passes by us every day. So there's this sort of um, tendency toward, uh, and I hate to use this word, but it is what it is, this segregation that, that causes communities to function uh, with it's almost like the old English aristocracy rules or the rules of Versailles court. You know, I can walk by this way, walk by this way, but I can't go in. I have the freedom as a citizen to go in. It's a church, so I'm technically welcome to go in, but even though I'm welcome, can I be received? Can I express mm. myself? Can I share? Can I make my story a part of the greater story of this community? So that was that is a bigger issue than I think anyone can resolve. But I think what we must do is to uh, accept the fact <laughs> that where we are now in this moment in time, especially post pandemic, uh, if I buy a house that's in Lancaster because I, my half million will yeah. get me a third bedroom, I'm going to go and then I'm going to come and commute in to support my family church where I was baptized, where my grandmother still goes, where I still have friends and kindred. So the, the commuting aspect can't be um, vilified because there might be very good reason for it. Take from the other side where you had people in the 09 crash. I can't afford my home anymore. Yeah. The one place that I can go and have some semblance of stability is my church family. I can't even give as much anymore because... I don't have the financial stability that I once did, right? But I still want to contribute some. One of my good friends who was, um, I can't say too much because it'll reveal who it is, but they are a pastor. They are Caucasian. And they had to take a $40,000 pay cut because uh, someone built apartments on their parking lot. Demographic changed instantly because people just stopped coming to church because they couldn't park anymore. Wow. Didn't make a deal with the building to allow them to park for two hours on a Sunday. That's crazy. Crazy. So uh, over, it was about a three year period where it, it was either he was going to have to take this pay cut or retire early. And if he left in that state, uh, someone coming in would have an even bigger challenge of pastoring because they'd have to sort of recover uh, from the ashes of development and progress. And some would say, well, why don't we mobilize and go and go to that apartment building and make the neighbors members, you know, make them feel welcome to our neighborhood. The people there were like, let's get this church out of here. How much is that property worth? And that's where we have this um, contention in our context right now, where uh, the church, a, a prestigious church, or even, you know, even a small church would represent, well, this is that oasis that I spoke of earlier, where people can come and go, we're all equal. We're all one and the same here. This is all great. Uh, I have people lusting over our church property right now. Uh, 
black, white, and otherwise, that people want to put apartments on it, businesses. I'm like, well, if you build me a, you know, a, a, a Starbucks, then maybe we can talk. <laughs> Let them tithe, okay? And then maybe yeah. I can work a few less hours at the corporate job. But until that happens, uh, we've got to maintain somehow. So it's it's an interesting it's an interesting time to be doing what we're doing and stay faithful to the ultimate call, which is uh, salvation and healing and hope and love. It's really hard to do. Um, but I say all the more. Uh, pastors should be able to at least function in their skill set, even if they don't have a completely separate vocation or, or occupation, I'll say occupation. Um, they still need to use those skills um, because the people don't have them. Mm -hmm. You know, you might have one or two members that are, you know, the high earners and the professional, this, that, and the other, but that's not what they're called to do. That's what we're called to do. So I think we have to take on the idea that I can't just put on my black or put on my robe or put on my stripes or put on my elbow patches. <laughs> and isolate myself. If anything, that means I got to go work in the vineyard all the more. Yeah. I'm, you know, as you're talking, I'm, I'm thinking and wondering, okay, well, in the past, the idea of the neighborhood church, um, you know, it makes sense because the community is immediate. Sure. And, um, but you know what? The automobile is a, a pretty new thing. Yeah. And even within the scope of the automobile, we um, we weren't commuting such long distances until maybe 50 years ago, yeah. you know, probably starting the 70s, I would think, you know, where you have the long commute mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, a basic commute, mm -hmm. um, you know, development of freeways from highways and, and, and things like this. And mm -hmm. um, how does, you know, how does that impact the the community that is formed you know the church family because it seems like okay if you walked or you took a horse yeah you know or you you know what how like how did you how was your mobility in the 1800s yeah how was it um in other periods and so the commute time could even be two hours to church whereas if you're in lancaster and if the freeways are open god willing um, you could probably make it in 90 minutes, yeah. watts, uh, you know. Um, Listen, I commuted from Burbank to Inglewood for 20 years. Um, I was in Burbank because that's where I landed for school. No one could understand why I lived there and why I would come so far for church. I couldn't find a church like I wanted to find in Burbank. Again, when I found out why that was, it was a little disheartening, but you know, you, you work it out. I, I, I'll share this. Um, when you hear the term master plan communities, right? There was a time where a master plan community by law was supposed to have certain land set aside for a library, for parks, for a post office, churches, um, all to be within walking distance, general walking distance. They even had swimming pools right. <laughs> included in these plans. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of these requirements were eventually weeded out because uh, they, for lack of a better term, they made things convenient for everybody. Uh, and unfortunately, and this is sort of more of a political thing, but the impact to churches, to communities, if I can't walk there, um, I won't bother. Uh, it's okay if I can drive, but think of it this way. When you mentioned the freeways, uh, the freeways were obsolete when they finished them, okay, in about 1960. The reason for that is that they accommodated or they were planning for a certain portion of the population not to have cars at all. Right, sure. Take that included moms yeah. and teens. You know, our, a family of four nowadays is going to have four cars, not just one. The presumption was that, you know, dad would go drive from the suburbs into town to work. Mom could go grocery hopping if one of the moms had a station wagon, maybe. Everybody else was supposed to ride the bus. If people had housekeepers or lawn keepers or whatever, they were on their own. <laughs> so once prosperity uh, came to everyone and, you know, this the, the idea of convenience was not limited to middle class white males, for lack of a better term. Um, then we had all the, oh, we we're overcrowded. We we're, it's too dense. It's too much. It's not convenient for anybody. Well, no, um, if it had been planned to be convenient for a wider cross section of the population, then we wouldn't have had these sort of spillovers that now have impacted 
you know, churches, communities, daycare. Daycare is one of the huge issues right now as we're returning from the virtual space back into, uh, you know, office buildings and so forth. A lot of people cannot go back to an office because there's nobody to take care of the kids. Now, do you have a theological or a moral um, debate about, well, who should and shouldn't be working outside the home in the first place? That's a little outdated. Uh, and then when you get to when the kids reach school age, if no one ever can walk to school anymore or the buses are going to take them an hour away or this or that, you end up with something having to give. What's going to give? Church. <laughs> My Sunday is the last day I have where I don't have to commute anywhere, why I don't have to go and spend all this money. And they're asking for offerings and alms uh, again. Um, you know, so 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 I think across the board, everybody, regardless of denomination or experience, is going to have to face some of these realities, right? And as such, if there is no baked-in respect for the clergy or the church, even to have land set aside or to have a variance available or tax breaks, whatever, um, then I think it's really incumbent on those of us who are you're in the educational sector, not pastoring a congregation, but there's a pastoral nature to the way that you express what you do to your students so that even if they're you know, studying languages and the migration of, of tongues and so forth, um, if there was a war that changed the way people spoke, it's good to know that context because we can now at least use that information to how we move forward in these literally unprecedented times. Yeah, um, well, that's certainly the case. And, you know, um, I, I wonder about that. I wonder about all these new developments and, you know, how housing is rising. But it's, I mean, it's all get, getting more and more dense. There's less yard space. Oh, yeah. And there's certainly, it's only homes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't know where the, you know, if the planning commission is at the city level, or if it's the developers who are pitching a certain thing, and oh, yeah. um, there, there's no vision for a, a real community beyond homes, beyond live dwellings, right? Um, you know, there's, they, there's an attack on green space, just just in general. Yeah, attack on green space, and what people have done is they found the leap loopholes uh, that will that they will include a so-called public green space, which they're supposed to have, uh, but they'll enclose it in the, um, you know, boundaries of the building. So people don't know it's there or they don't know that it's publicly accessible. And then they'll staff it with security so that if you show up, even though you have the right to, do you live here? Why yeah. are you here? What brings you here? Um, and if you're not in and out of there within an acceptable amount of time, you go. So these enclaves are, po are popping up. Um, and, you know, there's, I mean, we don't have to say that there has been a either decline or a separation um, from the average American citizen and, you know, devout spirituality, you know, whatever faith that is. I think everybody has experienced um, or at least witnessed um, a change from that level of devotion whereby it would be accepted and recognized um, in the in the broader world. I mean, I, I don't go in telling people I'm Pastor Hopkins. Usually people kind of fi figure that out, but there's this uh, uh, evaluation process. Well, okay, and what is that supposed to mean? You know, I don't see you on television. You know, now now I kind of do the, a small broadcast virtually uh, since the pandemic. But you know, if I if I'm if I'm not representing something more tangible, more lucrative, more potential to well, how are you gonna bless me? <laughs> People just aren't interested. Um, you know, so th that that challenge is certainly going to be seen as more acute and more I would even say dangerous because. Um, I mean, you have children, two beautiful, small children. Uh, they need a place to play. Uh, if you're out somewhere away from home, it shouldn't be, you shouldn't have to search high and low just to find a safe space for them. Uh, in the old days, and I, I wanted to put up a playground at our church. And they're like, well, kids don't really play outside anymore. I'm like, well, maybe there's a video game thing, but if we have it there and we say it's open for the community between certain hours, at least that draws something um, and allows people to have some access um, 
you know, again, it's a, it's a soft, easy evangelism, but little things like that start to go away because, well, now it's a, it's an insurance risk. Do we really want children on a jungle gym who could fall off? They cry, their moms are caring, we get sued, we get shut down. You know, th there's a lot that goes into um, how we're impacted before we even realize that we're in a whole new, <laughs> a whole new world. Yeah, we really and then you are. gotta study and preach on Sunday. So hey, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> then you gotta do the job proper. Uh, well, what what did you come away with? You know, what did you sort of conclude through your research? Um, and you know, is there further um, room for growth? Sure, um, I would say the the largest takeaway uh, from my research and the experience that accompanied it was for spiritual leaders, pastors, I would say of all kinds, to manage their health, self-care, um, to be willing to have some accountability partners uh, outside of spouse or, you know, governing boards, that kind of thing, but uh, either fellow colleagues or people in the clinical space, uh, just people that you can sort of vent to, um, for your human side, for your secular side. I, I have no problem really with, with clinical uh, support, but some may, uh, but I would say there's still got to be some, you know, c confess your sins one to another. You know, there's gotta be some area of release uh, where you're not trying to overburden yourself. I became very ill at one point during my studies um, I, it was funny, I was working on a plan of self-care, and then I ended up in the hospital. Um, there was a condition, but it was exacerbated by the stress of it yeah. all. So being in a dual vocation, you're going to have do double the stress, or at least double the risk for stress. So you've got to employ some things to balance that out. So for example, my jobs, wherever I work, they know that I have this pastoral job. It's a level of exposure. I never thought I'd have to tell people about my personal business and what I do. But by putting that up front, even if they're not a religious organization, they will have to acknowledge this is a responsibility that he has. And if I request time or if I take time at a certain you know period of whatever, um, at least they know I'm not trying to run some sort of you know secrecy game. Um, from, that's a personal element, self-care. Uh, then when it comes to doing the work, is there an impact on working outside of church versus working in church? Um, uh, sure, uh, but our Jewish brothers and sisters have uh, managed um, to regulate work and so forth uh, through Sabbath observance uh, mm -hmm. and things of that nature, uh, even down to some of the regulations on, you know, diet and that kind of thing. Uh, and my point with all that is whatever it is we're doing, um, as long as we understand there will be an impact on the ministry or the minister, okay? Um, when I go to the mall and I overhear young people using crazy language and, you know, whatever, doing all sorts of stuff. Wow. I'm not a parent. Um, I'm not a police officer. I'm a pastor. I can't even go up to them as I would if I were wearing a collar or wearing the black or in, you know, the regality of my regalia. Uh, I walk up to them. They're still going to say, well, who's this guy? Who are you? Why would you even care? But that means I've got to go into these secular places, prayed up, willing to call on my heavenly strength uh, in the most unlikely places. And I think what we've gotten away from as a, as a culture writ large um, is that we can operate. We are supposed to go um, and impact, even if it's silently through prayer, even if it's through observation and being willing to speak up if someone is in trouble. Yes, I'm probably going to be the one. If I see an accident, I'll pull over and ask if there's anything that I can do, you know, little things like that. And then when you bring that back to, um, you know, well, are you dragging that secular stuff into the church place? Well, I have definitely been able to in, engage a degree of efficiency so that the work is easier. Um, the internet, being able to study there on site, we have the internet available for people if they want to use their Bible app or whatever, get on Zoom, 
there's no excuses <laughs> to to co not connecting or not showing up now. Uh, whereas before, when we were commuter only, people if they couldn't come, they just couldn't come. Now we've kind of taken away that excuse. So it's really a matter of being aware of um, the opportunities you have to use the best of your gifts, right, for where you are at any given time and look for those opportunities where if our humanity or our flesh is not going to do the trick, uh, we are God's messenger for a reason, for a purpose. Even if he's just exposing us to opportunities that we might have to say, this is where our mission is today. This is where we need to go and spread this gospel into this place or into this uh, arena where there is hunger or lack or suffering. Um, being aware of that is is better than being unaware and saying, but I'm so spiritual. Uh, I shouldn't have to be exposed to that. I think if we're not, uh, we're not on the job. So there you have it. That's beautiful. And, um, you know, I, I knew, I know uh, a, a priest who recently took a break. Um, he, he stepped down from his mm. parish community just because there's no self-care. Yeah. And, um, you know, exactly. look, we're people, you know, yeah. we're all people and um, we're all members of a body, you know, yeah. and sometimes uh, you said it, you, you, the person has to put together a, a cohort you know, mm -hmm. a, a group of, uh, what do you call them? Functionaries, people who are gonna, <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're going to, they're going to serve a purpose, you know, in, in the mechanical, if, if I may, um, actions of the body, right? Like if, if we are one body, then, um, it makes sense that we don't do all the work. If you do all the work in the body, the other parts are going to atrophy. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so, you know, there, there has to be some sort of, um, cooperative you know action operation action same thing okay anyway uh, let me, but, let me uh, tell you something. yeah let please me real quick i'm gonna say two words and i know there'll be a reaction <clears throat> and here goes sunday pie <laughs> okay now for the viewing audience there was a significant period of time which seems like ancient history now you know uh, but we would fellowship on Sundays after my after my long commute to Inglewood to the church I was uh, with at the time, <laughs> back to Burbank Glendale area, and we would talk about movies and you know the things we were studying and languages and and culture and just sort of hang out with dessert on a Sunday evening after having worked and labored and served and been in our highest um, uh, ecumenical status. Um, you know, we've worn the vestments and we've, you know, lit the candles and we've led the people and we've, you know, done all those things of, of duty and honor and service, which we love doing, but we still needed those moments to just hang out. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a pastoral nature in that that i think goes overlooked because even though we were not perhaps at our you know highest positions where we are at this moment it was preparation and i would say anyone who is you know faced with uh even if you're a, a singular vocation pastoral only you got to have a life okay mm -hmm. and you've got to have those things that feed and nurture you if jesus went to sleep on the boat in the midst of the storm he was probably so tired that if the storm had wiped everybody else out, uh, he might have awakened and like, okay, I really didn't want that to happen. Let's let's bring them all back. In other words, he was going to get his rest because he needed it. And if we have that as an example, uh, even as he reminded us, Sabbath is for us, not us for Sabbath. So taking that time, making that time, even if it's something as small as, you know what, I'm going to stop let's get dessert, let's chat for a few minutes and unload vent a little bit. I think that's going to clear out some room where this is what got me um, in this process. If I make myself available, if I make space available in my mind, in my spirit, in my, in my, in myself, then that's where God is going to be able to begin restoring me, replenishing me. He makes us lie down in the green pastures, not to get dirty, but to get some rest. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so if you find yourself for whatever reason, having to be a multi-platform person, then that means you have to, I would say, dedicate and allocate that time uh, for restoration, for, you know, self-care, just that time to be off. Okay. 
yes, it's ministry is full time, pastoring is full time, and you don't really turn off the switch, but you do get you're allowed to uh, let let your body restore. Um, and when you don't, um, of course, that leads to other temptations to martyr yourself. Oh, well, I can't because I'm so busy and I'm serving. And, you know, I, I don't really think I don't think the Lord wants to hear us uh, make excuses for why we didn't uh, obey the command to take care of these vessels while we have them. Uh, and the final thing I'll say is as COVID hit the day I presented my dissertation, literally, I was flying into New York with, you know, makeshift masks and things were closing down around us and so forth. Within two weeks, I knew several pastors who had died because of the COVID, but also just the underlying uh, conditions that are exacerbated by stress and lack of self-care. Mm. And I, I grappled with that because I'm like, well, were they being punished? Were they, you know, snuffed out because of some wrong? What I came to was that they would not have stopped Okay, they would have continued literally working themselves to death under that old model. So I do see this as sort of before and after the flood kind of thing where we do have to recognize coming out of this wilderness. <laughs> um, we've, we've got to do so uh, and do our worship on the mountain and then um, enjoy a little feast. Let's let's get a fatted calf in here or something and uh, <laughs> just enjoy well, so that we can good. live and serve again another day. <laughs> Well, where can people find you if they want to get in touch or follow your work? If you want to find me, my website is dochopent.com, D-O-C-H-O-P-E-N-T.com. I am on Instagram at I am dochop, I-A-M-D-O-C-H-O-P. Uh, and in general, um, my church service is on uh, Facebook. It's First Timothy Missionary Baptist Church. Wonderful people there. Uh, so you can find us on Facebook and see our um, uh, service information. It's on Zoom each Sunday at 11. Uh, and I might pop up just anywhere. If you give me a, give me, give me a little time to save up some plane fare, you know, hey, I'm going to be everywhere. So there we have it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, thanks for coming on today. Thank you. And, Thank you. Uh, you know, we'll do this more often for sure. And, sure. Uh, you know, I, I too, I don't know if I hope to get back to LA. I, I kind of uh, I used up all my LA points uh, <laughs> for the good, you know, chunk of my, my life thus far. But who knows? I, I could be out there, maybe catch a game at the Coliseum or something. So you've um, got a place to visit. You're always welcome. And well, you're going to have to do some Disney time before it's all over. So I'll, I'll just I wait. know, right? I know. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, my friend. We'll talk soon. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.